you can tell that there's a disconnect. And one thing I did with baby was go to the Minnesota Lakes Open practice, which was awesome. It gave me a very enjoyable time watching another team work well together and just to know what their history was. I think these events really help out because it brings multiple female veterans together and with that camaraderie it gets to be more recognition.
She holds a Master's of Arts degree in Community and Clinical Psychology. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Linda Davis. I just raised my hands because as you can see, I'm vertically challenged and I was worth it. Be able to see me over there. Sometimes these podiums are very, very big. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. First, I want you all to know how determined, how good your staff is in Washington, D.C. at the DA meeting. This, and, and Joy knows, she's calling out how responsive Congress is to you all because of the representation you have in Washington, and an example of how responsive we are at the Department of Veterans Affairs. You're gonna hear about that, but it's also because of the leadership that you have in Washington, and Adrian, that includes you too. Thank you, some of the brightest, most helpful people. So, and I know they're getting that from you all, okay? So continue to voice that, it's essential to us. I'm going to run through some slides um, to share with you overarching the Secretary's commitment to what we're trying to do a little bit differently in the VA under his tenure. And I will be around afterwards with my team, and part of what you will hear in the theme is we are truly trying to listen through every channel we can to understand the moments that matter to you and to make a change to get those so that you can have a better experience. We'll stay around and listen to what recommendations that you have. So I do get to run something called our Veteran Experience Office. Well, we all have experiences as veterans, but they're not always good whether we're using the VA or not. What I want to tell you what we're doing under this current um, VA secretary is we're trying to take the best in the industry that they have to deal with in improving customer service, and we're trying to make that available to the way we run things in the VA, whether it's benefits, whether it's health care, memorial services. Memorial services doesn't need a lot of help. They're doing a bang-up job, but we can always do better. So we're leveraging all these tools. The kind of support that you get when you call USAA or another organization when you feel like you may have gotten really good customer service. That is our goal. It's a stretch goal, I understand. I started in the VA in the 70s. I know what is and isn't working. Um, a lot more is working now than it used to. So we're trying to be this shared engine and help all the administrations. We have some principle, and it starts with this commitment by the secretary to improve the culture and get to the point where we're truly giving you all a world-class customer service. So the secretary talks about customer service, and he applies it to our veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors. Most recently, you will hear us talk about not just the veteran, but it's the families, caregivers, and survivors. When I was at DOD, we know that you may assess an individual service member, but you retain the entire family, and the entire family is impacted. Even if there is not a um, marriage, there is a mother and a father and siblings. We are all impacted. So our job is to look at the whole veteran and everybody that supports him or her. We're also looking at our employees. It doesn't do any good for us to try to give you customer service that is positive if we're not training our employees and empowering them and making sure there's enough of them to be able to deliver that service. So this is what we are working on in my job, my office. We have the job to implement this for the secretary. And the way we evaluate it, the way we hold ourselves accountable is through these metrics. So our greatest goal is to earn your trust so you will choose the VA. How do we know if we're achieving that? On, we're, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the way we 
basically rate ourselves and let you rate us, but it's along three metrics. Three, let's see, one, two, three, okay. I'm dyslexic, but I should be able to still count. Um, and um, so these three metrics are the ones that are used by industry to rate customer service. Ease, can you get in to get an appointment? Effectiveness, once you get the appointment, is it helpful? Did it do what you needed to get done? And then three, the emotional resonance. Were you treated with respect? Did that person who was helping you accord you the dignity that you deserved? So these are the things we're looking at, and we're looking at how we then take all the information I'm going to tell you that we're collecting. We're using it for specific purposes. One of those purposes is we're using it for customer service, and I'll give you an example of that soon, a specific woman veteran that gave us feedback that we did something about it right away. But we're also trying to improve overall performance. Change, if 12 veterans at one location are telling us something, it's probably something we need to learn to, learn from, that we can then help change that program. And we're also using it in policy. So you're gonna to begin to see changes in the way we, we um, make determinations and decisions about our own budget based on how we're performing. Okay, and including, um, Joy, in your booklet, the wonderful booklet that you shared, on page three, there's a recommendation that DAB has about uh, performance improvements. And in fact, we have now built it into the performance of SES. So you cannot be a leader in the VA unless you are doing the things I'm gonna to talk to you about in terms of customer service. Um, we've got some core capabilities. I told you about business and industry and using their tools. I just want to run through some of these and I will hand, uh, show some of our tools, the data, etc. And then you can, um, I'll tell you how to get a copy and other things like that. Um, first of all, the data, this is key. We want to make sure we're listening to the voice of the veteran. We have a tool called v or veteran signals, and that enables us to survey veterans in real time as soon as they had a service, and to give that feedback to the providers and the leaderships. So let's just take outpatient services. Some of you may have received the last time you had a visit to uh, an outpatient, whether it's the pharmacy, whether it's dialysis, um, primary care, you might have gotten a survey, and on there you have some simple questions, that you can fill out, um, you know, a, a quantitative main method, and then you can also give your comments. We actually collect those twice a week, and that information goes immediately into the facility where you got the service. And our directors and our business directors are looking at that and determining what they can do to improve not only the programs that are serving you, but also any one particular service that may have not been the best it could be for you. Now, I did hear from my good friend Pat, who's in the audience, that uh, he asked for a call back on his survey, and he hasn't gotten it yet. But he can tell me, and I can tell the director of that hospital, that Mr. Maney's still waiting for his call back, please, sir. Okay. So we have this, our um, B signals that we're working on. Um, we also have other tools. We have things that you're gonna hear like our quick start guides. How do we make something simple and easy to understand to get access? Remember I said ease? This happens to be for survivors. This is coming out. It tells somebody who is surviving the loss of a military or veteran loved one how to get the benefits. It's an overwhelming, um, difficult thing at a time that is very hard for most of us to bear and to have something very simple and then have our wonderful Office of Survivor Assistance is a great benefit. Um, we've got different things um, that we have there. Also our VA Welcome Kit and if I don't show you the VA Welcome Kit I'm going to get in a bunch of trouble. These are in the back. Tim's handing them out. There are Tim's over there and Andy. We've got these welcome kits. We want to, and Jim, 
We want to make sure that you get copies of these. Keep your hands up and we'll give them to you. When you left the military, you went through the TAP, right? Transition Assistance Program. They gave you something that looked like the Code of Federal Regulations. You couldn't read it, you probably didn't try. If you did try, you eventually threw it away. And nobody else in the family got to look at it. It's totally confusing. This is not that. This is awesome, okay? So this is based on something other cool thing we do. I'm all about toys. So we use human-centered design, a fancy word for listening, um, to map the experience of our veterans from the point at which you assessed to the point at which you're using memorial services and beyond, because even after you're gone, your family will still be in the family of the VA. So these, when we do this across the continuum, we listen and hear the moments that matter to you. Those moments that matter are all in this welcome kit that you're going to get. And under each one, healthcare, it gives you the phone numbers. It gives you the website. It will tell you how to get the Office of Suicide Prevention. And it will also tell you how to get the um, Women Veterans uh, Office. So here's the map I'm talking about now. You see, CX means it's a fancy word for customer service. Um, so it is the journey map that I'm talking about now to you. And this is all available online to you if we can make sure that DA has lots of copies. Um, but we'll capture those moments. Um, and then what do we do with those? After we understand a moment matters to a veteran, we're doing training. We have a training called Own the Moment, and it teaches people literally, when you see somebody 10 feet away, you look at them. When they're four feet, you acknowledge them. You engage with those veterans and connect with them, because that is the single thing about emotional resonance and respect. We've already trained 75,000 at our VA medical centers across the country. We are going to get to every single employee at the VA with that training. And we can now look at not just all veterans, but we can dig deeper and we can look to women veterans. So with organizations and focus groups like DAV, and Joy and I were talking about making sure we're using the DAV membership who happens to be women when we're doing focus groups with the Office of Women and Veterans, um, that make sure we reach out to you. But we can do this. Your experience across that journey, and we've done these journey maps for how you use outpatient, inpatient, um, telemedicine, etc. My experience as a women veteran will be different than my colleagues, whether I'm using benefits or I'm using health care. It is what it is. Um, and we need to understand those moments that matter to the women veterans so we can make adjustments in the way we deliver services if they're needed. But in all cases, they have to be the highest consistent quality. So I was telling you a little bit about the key signals. Um, when we do the surveys. I want to give you an example we just pulled out of there today from um, my staff in Washington. We can look at all of these, and we have tens of thousands of these. Um, and here's veteran feedback on one of them, because they can do, they can leave a comment. This is the fourth time I've been rescheduled due to the doctor's availability instead of the original three months between now and six months. I also do not receive a call about needing to be rescheduled until the week of the appointment, expecting my own schedule at work. Who's ever had that experience? Any trouble with scheduling? It's actually one of the number one challenges that we have. Uh, veterans tell us of the moments that matter most to them when receiving outpatient care, scheduling an appointment, meeting the care provider, and follow-up visits and specialty care, in or outside of me, are all the hardest ones to do, okay? So this particular person, this veteran, who happened to be a woman, we can tell from the surveys if it's 
to male or female if they self-identify. They responded, and our service recovery, remember I said we're doing something about this, we're not just program, for, for, but for individual veterans, was to spoke to the veteran about the cancer appointments, call that veteran back, willing to reschedule to, in this case, Pittsburgh, tell us psychiatry. So that veteran did not have to come in. And the veteran ended up having that distance tele-psychiatry and mental health and was satisfied with the treatment option. That's what we're trying to get to, is satisfaction. I don't want to go on too long, but I'll go into just really quickly. We couldn't do any of this stuff. I can have tools, technology, so what? It doesn't matter unless it's engaged with you all and it's put to your service. And I, when I mean you, I'm really talking to you about the DAE and in your communities. So when we went, I talked about the different um, areas we're working in, data, tools, technology. Up there, if you read it really quickly, is engagement. What does that mean? We know VA can't do it alone. I'm in your community because I want to listen to to what you're saying, but I also want to partner with you and work with you and your local, whether, whether it's a chapter or a post or a, a nonprofit or a um, faith-based organization. So we have these, what we call our community veteran engagement boards, um, all over the country. And if you're not engaged with one, I would ask you to please, please, please do so. Jim, where are you? Okay, we're getting more welcome kids. Jim is going to be in the back of the room. He and Andy can help you identify and sign up for CVEC. I want those CVECs to be flooded with you all from the DAV and also especially with women veterans. Okay? We really need to do that. And with your family members too. We're doing on this, we're doing clergy training around mental health, suicide prevention, lethal weapons, and I know you'll be hearing a lot about more of those from we're working on the mayor's challenge with your community and governor's challenges. We're doing, I said, the clergy training. We're also going to be doing surveys in communities, see signals, community signals, which will help us understand what's different about this community and do they have enough resources generally for addressing mental health needs. Um, so we're glad that you can get more engaged in those. And we're not doing this alone. As I mentioned, we're doing this with partnerships. We have a very concerted effort to work closely. So if you have an organization in your community that you think is valuable, Andy's going to be very, very interested over there in hearing about it. Here's the partnerships we're doing. And look, I love this. I've been to one of them myself, the Boulder Crest Retreats up there. You heard that in the, in the wonderful video that Joy had put together. Um, we have retreats with a lot of different organizations. The cool thing about here is, so the Bob Woodworth Foundation, we have a collaboration with them. That was also mentioned in things like, in the Joy's report, the in vitro fertilization. If you look up there into LinkedIn, you, you can get a free premium membership for LinkedIn for related to help you get better um, connections for employment and education. We also have my last slide. We have a great new resource that Tim has put together. And we send out almost 10 million emails every week that has, it's easy to use, maybe it's got four or five things in there. It starts off with telling you what you can have for free. How do you get your park memberships for free? Travels for free? The, like I said, the LinkedIn for free. Um, and VetTix. VetTix is one of the examples that we have up there. Free concert tickets. Who doesn't like that? But it also will give you key information about some very important things that the VA has for you, or how to order the welcome kit, or how to access the National Resource Directory, which will have um, uh, resources not only from VA, but from DOD 
and from your communities. You could put in something that's working for you into that national resource for It's the yellow books that we all need to be using. So I'm a little bit excited about what we're doing. I'm excited about the potential. Um, after coming on board in the 70s, in the 70s with uh, my fellow peers from the Vietnam era and seeing what we did and didn't do then, um, I am very honored to have a second opportunity to be of service and to work with these wonderful people, both in the VA and outside the VA. And we've got to get, we're not going to fix it all. You know, I'm going to be out of my ear or collapse in a couple of years, but um, I'm past my cell date now. I just had another birthday. Uh, but um, but we're going to, we can do a few things. So these moments that matter to you, what is the most important thing? On your list, what are the three things we have to solve that would help you increase your trust in VA and your voice? and your choice of the end. And I know you've got an idea, we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, but I want to work with you to get those things. And so you will see this slide, I know Joy will have it available later. This is all the resources that we have to tell you about, including please, 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 don't hesitate to call our White House VA hotline, 24-7, 365, run by vets and their families for veterans. That's available. Warm handoff to the women's line and to the crisis line. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. I think it's really important to point out because, um, you know, these are things that we're seeing being done for the first time. And um, those of us that have been around well, we've seen tremendous changes, and the best thing, um, we made the copy from the Veterans Experience Office for all of you to pick up about women veterans listening and collaborating. I think this, when I said this, I definitely wanted you to be here to tell our women veterans um, about this because it's really um, having these, um, you know, getting the feedback from women themselves, be able to always ask What's the one thing that we can do? I said, talk to women veterans. They will tell you. Without a question, they will tell you what's working, what's not. And I think um, I really enjoyed looking at your publishing, you know, um, building most of women veterans, the booklet, which goes through much of what you were talking about today and has the information for the Women Veterans Call Center on here. So that's a great resource for everyone. And um, I just for sure wanted to be you know, make sure that you have the opportunity to hear it right from the VA. So we, let's give her a great hand. She's, I think I got it. Our second guest speaker today is Ms. Jacqueline Haysburg. She was appointed Executive Director of the Department of Veterans Affairs Center for Women Veterans on February 17, 2019. In, in this capacity, she serves as the VA Secretary Wilkie's primary advisor at the Department of Policies, Programs, and Legislation Affecting Women Veterans. She oversees the center's activities, which include monitoring and coordinating VA's administration of health care, benefits, and programs for women veterans. Her duties also include serving as the Chief Advocate for Cultural Transformation, focused on embracing women veterans' service and accomplishments, recognizing their military service and contributions, and raising awareness of the responsibility to treat all women veterans with dignity and respect. Ms. Haysburg is a veteran of the U.S. Air Force, where she attained the rank of major and served as an education and training officer. She has held a variety of leadership positions in the executive branch, federal and state government, as well as the private sector. It's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Jacqueline Haysburg.
started, there was a young woman, sister, sister veteran in the back, and you know who you are. Please don't leave without us finishing our conversation, okay? Thank you. All right. Uh, first, before I get started, on behalf of uh, Secretary Wilkie, I met with him and he asked me to specifically pass on to you all, thank you for your service. The Center for uh, Women Veterans appreciates invaluable opportunities like this to be able to participate and to talk with you because it re-emphasizes the VA commitment to providing quality service to our nation's women veterans. And it's truly my honor to be able to speak uh, with you today. Before I go any further, please make sure to take out your phones and take pictures of our videos because I want you, when late at night when you've got absolutely nothing to do and you're truly bored, you can pull these out and do your homework. And I'm serious when I ask you to please use our resources, okay? That's why we're here. All right, so I want to tell you guys, so I take notes and I specifically read because I love to talk. And if you knew my husband, he'd say, oh, Jackie, you know what, you've got to cut that down. You know, so I've got 20 minutes worth of speaking right here, so I'm going to stick to it. But I also am, have written it down because I want to make sure that you all understand and hear my words and uh, use them. Okay? So the Center for Women Veterans was established by Congress in 1994, and the reason it was established was because it um, wanted to make sure that the VA monitors the administration of benefits and services for our women veterans. As Executive Director of the Women's Center, my job is to advise the Secretary on issues that impact women veterans. My team and I are dedicated to empowering you. And we do this to ensure that you're aware of and have access to the benefits and services that you earn and you deserve. You deserve them because you earn them. Our vision is to create policies to the women veterans across the VA. Our office works hand in hand with the VBA, or the Benefits Administration, Health Administration, NCA, which is the Cemetery Administration, and VEO, which is the Veterans Experience Office. That's Linda's office. And this is to ensure that your needs are recognized and met. The CWB, or our office, is the portal for all things women veterans. Did I get it? Did I just look at it? Okay, thank you. Um, so we're the portal for all things women veterans, and we're here to create a positive veterans experience for you. I'm often asked, how does the center help women veterans? And my short answer is this. We integrate, we advocate, we connect, and we conduct outreach to recruit women veterans not connected to the VA and further inform those that are, meaning you. The center serves as an integrator through our management of the VA's Cross Administration Women's Veterans Program. The collaboration promotes an open exchange of information about what the VA is doing to address the needs of women veterans, and more importantly, helps to identify gaps so that we can enhance how the VA meets those needs. So if I start dancing, it's because that music, yeah. Yeah, I don't want to scare you. Right. As um, an integrator, we refer women veterans requests to assist to the appropriate VA offices. And we do this to ensure timely action to your concerns. The center advocates and serves as a resource hub for you and those who serve you. As a connector, the center connects you to the local, state, federal,
resources to address your individual concerns and we conduct outreach activities to educate you on benefits and services you have earned and you deserve. I don't know if everybody knew this, but there are 22 million veterans currently living today. Women veterans represent about 2 million of those, or approximately 9.5% of the total veterans population. Although the overall veterans population is expected to decline through 2040, it's anticipated that women veterans population will continue to increase reaching 12.4% by 2020. The center's long-term desired outcome is to achieve full equity in access, wait times, outcomes, use, trust, and satisfaction for our women veterans. It's the center's goal to shape its strategic approach and operating plan to accommodate those evolving needs and ensure that VA's program, that our VA programs and services continue to anticipate those evolving needs through research and development. To accomplish this extraordinary endeavor, the center devised a strategy that aligns the mandate with the VA strategic goals across five critical areas of outreach which is internal and external advocacy. We also include research, performance management, and compliance. Working collaboratively with offices across the VA, the modernization and alignment of the center will ensure we assist with enterprise-wide performance management and I'm sorry, compliance in order to ensure women veterans receive equitable services and benefits. But um, let me just say this, through our internal and external partnerships and initiatives, we're diligently working hard to increase public awareness of women veterans' experiences and contributions to our nations. Collaboration with local and state federal government, as I mentioned before, uh, are, those, are some of those areas that we're looking at. Veteran service organizations, such as the DAP, and other non-governmental organizations let the center have a strong impact in addressing the evolving needs of women veterans. Because if we're to give women veterans your due consideration and recognition to your contributions, we have to work together. All right, now we're on the way. In 2019, the center launched its Women Veterans Trailblazer Initiative. We recognized 15 women veterans selected from across the nation. These phenomenal women blazed the trails for others to follow and continues to give back their, to their communities. We honored them with the ceremony at the Women's Memorial in Arlington and at uh, the uh, BACA or our uh, organization or the headquarters in Washington where we showed a documentary featuring these amazing women. We educate our internal and external stakeholders on their responsibilities to acknowledge the contributions and cultural transformations of women veterans through awareness campaigns and initiatives which have been replicated VA-wide and by other organizations nationally and internationally. Here's something that we know as women. Since many women veterans don't identify as the center wants to find those women and educate them on the services that the VA offers for their specific needs. One way of doing that is that, again, we have these contributions that you saw uh, for our trailblazers, but we also have other uh, programs such as the I Am Not Invisible campaign. Again, many of us don't see ourselves as women veterans. We want to change that. 
And one way of doing that is to let the whole country know, through a lot of our programs, that these women in your communities were on the front line. They were support for the military. They put their heads down, we put our heads down, and our chin up, and we conducted business as usual. When we came back home, we didn't necessarily tell people what we did. We just did it because that's what we do. Okay. I told you I have to stay on track. Um, next year we'll have a Women Veterans uh, Veteran Summit. And we're looking forward to seeing many of you there. So I want to make sure that you get our website so that you can follow us and attend next year. We've got the National Baby, set, uh, baby Showers that um, we make sure that uh, women veterans who choose to raise families start out on a good foot and have baby uh, blankets and, and um, diapers and all that they need to start their, their families out right. Every month we have a National Partners Breakfast of which Joy participates in. Every single month, um, you all have a better representative. And yeah, um, for those that can't come to Washington it, it, it's and uh, share donuts with us, we've opened up a dance line so that they can call it. Mark's is 14216, so it's not bad. Yep. Bye. It works well. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Okay. Okay, the I Am Not Invisible uh, campaign, or the I Am uh, initiative, was initially developed by the Oregon, Oregon, I'm trying that again, the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs to celebrate the contributions of two million living women veterans and to increase awareness and dialogue among women veterans. In 2018, we began to sponsor similar exhibits by dispatching VA photographers. Gene Russell, and if you haven't met him, you will meet him uh, soon because we're going to have uh, some um, presentations on our website. But he's been phenomenal in reaching out to these women uh, veterans uh, at various sites throughout the country to uh, photograph women veterans serving our uh, nation. These photos, this photo displays, have been shared through the center's digital channels. As of August 2019, 1,135 women veterans in 19 states and 31 cities have been photographed. And by October, we're projected to have a photograph in 31 states. The center will ensure that it's messaging and congressionally mandated activities aligned with the uh, Secretary's priorities. Our aim is to increase the awareness among women veterans and their supporters to aid and encourage them in applying for and obtaining their VA benefits and services. We want to eliminate disparities in benefit usage, service, and care and improve the overall women veterans experience within the VA through internal and our external advocacy. And we want to increase the understanding of root causes that impact women veterans through research with a focus on vulnerable populations to improve VA modernization initiatives. And we want to emphasize accountability in our sector's culture by setting ambitious goals while transparently and honestly assessing program and progress towards those goals and influencing peer organizations to do the same. In addition to what the center is doing to serve women veterans and to enhance their access to veterans um, or VA benefits and services, the VA's Women Health Service has a call center and it's up on um, the board up there, and that is to provide information about gender-specific 
health care, and other health care related services. Each medical facility has a women's veteran program manager available to help you teach and coordinate your care. And the regional offices have women veterans coordinators on hand to assist with claims. Finally, I want to, um, you to make sure, please, to visit our center's website. I have the honor of working with some of the smartest folks in VA and those that are um, very smart in technology. You're going to see some major changes there, and you'll hear my comments of what I found based on talking with you. The re other reason I want you to follow up and look at our website too is because I want to make sure that I include your voice as well and quotes as well. So please make sure you um, take a picture of our website because I haven't asked. That's the other thing that my husband says. Boy, you ask a lot, don't you? Well, yeah, I kind of do. Because I need your help. I want to, before I do that, I want to iterate that the VA is committed to ensuring that you receive quality care to meet your evolving needs. We are the portal for all things women veterans at the VA, and our job is to work with all of our stakeholders and partners to ensure that women veterans are taken care of and that all of your needs are met with world-class support. So here's my ask. I know that there are many women who are doing well. I know that there are many women veterans who could be doing better. I want to make sure that women veterans across the board but especially those women veterans who don't see themselves as women veterans, who see themselves as invisible, receive the support that they need and deserve. So my ask to everybody in this room is, if you know of women veterans, when you run across women veterans who are not receiving the support, who are not receiving VA, VBA, NCA, that's the cemetery. You're not receiving those. Grab them by the hand and help them find us. Help us find them. Because that's why we're here. So I want to just tell you too, I haven't mentioned this, but um, so I come from a family of veterans. That's all I know. My dad was a 33-year Marine, master gun. My uncle was a Monmouth Point Marine. If you do your homework, you know what that means, right? My sister was Army. Absolutely, absolutely. And I was Air Force, so you could imagine what that was like when I went home. Yeah, and we live right outside of Camp Virginia, North Carolina. So when I go home, I have to sneak in. <laughs> okay. So, but I'm saying this to say that um, I know veterans. I, I was born in Camp Virginia, North Carolina. We were a terrorist. Camp Pendleton. All right. So, but what I am looking for is I need your support because I can't do it by myself. Um, and thank you very much. Okay, so don't make me cry. Um, there is, Michelle is in the back back there, and I, I was very happy to see you all take the um, um, paraphernalia that's back there, but let me just tell you, can, can the, uh, the men veterans, can you raise your hands for these are our partners. Okay, I don't want to cry. If um, we need to um, go through these slides again, we can make sure we do that, but I want to make sure that you guys get the information. And 
I want to hear from you. And we've got our website on our business cards back there. We've got um, a website that you can go to. And please, 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 please use it because once you respond on there, and I'm going to use you, I'm going to ask for your help. You bet your boots on that one. Okay? And we'll use your quotes on how good, bad, and different on how you feel about the VA. Because we can use that to make things better. One more thing. When I was a kid, uh, everybody, you know, we would be on a um, low dependent basis when I was a kid. And everybody knew it. If you had a loved one, you would not send them to the VA because you knew they weren't coming back. But I'm here to tell you right here, right now, that the people that are in these positions and making these changes and want to support here, they are the right people at the right time to make those changes at the VA to best support veterans, women veterans' needs. And anybody who knows me knows that I don't say a thing that I don't mean. All right, five up now. So thank you for allowing us to be here, and very honored and proud.
That is 1-855-948-2311. And I would like to say regarding that, although they can use the White House hotline, your um, office has been incredible. Um, Jackie, your office, anytime we have an issue, I want to better either, you know, Dr. Hayes' office or your office, you guys jump right on it. I've been so pleased with one of the women that called us and they're upset and had a really bad experience. They can't get what they need. You guys are on it. We have regional people throughout and everyone who has called us really thank you said, oh my gosh, I got to call right back. And they took care of the issue. And that's what I want to hear. You know, that someone's listening. If something's got a problem, we just want to get it resolved. So, Thank you to you and your team for being so responsible and making that a priority. I'm going to now um, um, provide you some information about our next guest speaker. Dr. Lisa Kearney is the acting deputy director in the Department of Veterans Affairs Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention. Her work focuses on the development of VA's comprehensive public health approach to suicide prevention and overseeing the office's day-to-day -day operations. Dr. Kearney worked nationally as part of the executive team in the VA Office of Mental Health Operations as a senior consultant for technical assistance overseeing mental health policy implementation through quality improvement site visits across the VA system. Dr. Kearney is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin with a PhD in counseling psychology and is a board-certified clinical health psychology. She served as the Chief of Psychology, Assistant Chief Director of Training and Director of Primary Care Mental Health Integration at the VA South Texas Veterans Healthcare System. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Kearney. Compared to non-veterans. 
In fact, 41.2% of women veterans who died by suicide died by firearm. Compared to the national population of uh, women generally, 32.4%. So I also want to point out the rate is highest for middle-aged women veterans. So we must do something about this. Men are more likely than women to die by suicide, but I would like to point out the second item here is more women attempt suicide than men. But they're less likely to die because they're less likely to use the means. Women are more likely to report suicidal ideation attempts and more likely to be hospitalized for attempts. But I'd like to share with you a little gap in where we need more knowledge in this area and what the VA is doing in partnership with researchers across the country is to study things beyond just mental health concerns. Lots of people die by suicide, not because of a mental health issue, but because of other life struggles that they're dealing with. So we need to study more factors related to social issues that one's facing, economic challenges, financial concerns that we face, uh, cultural factors, educational factors, the experience of childhood abuse or interpersonal violence, these are all things that increase the likelihood for suicide. And so one of our calls is to begin to shift the paradigm of what we're saying to also look at these other factors that are salient for us. So in women veterans, I'd like to point out a few risk factors, things that you all may begin to wish to look for yourselves and begin to identify how do I personally reach out to women veterans who may have some of these risk factors. One in particular is substance use disorders. Substance use disorders robustly predict the likelihood of having a suicide attempt in one's life and to complete suicide, and this is actually higher for women than men. This is often something we use to help cope with problems. We drink more, we use more drugs. That's the case for men and women. And one of the things I loved in the report that you all just gave me, I was able to read that um, this morning, was talking about how we need to expand our substance use disorder treatment to also have some women's only types of groups available. Some of our VAs have that, some of those don't. And how do we have work with our community partners to provide that as well? Psychiatric disorders, I don't want to um, not underscore this. Certainly individuals who have mental health disorders are more likely to attempt and complete suicide. That's, that's the case for men and women. But this link is stronger for women veterans. One thing that um, I'd like to note is also a concern about eating disorders. Eating disorders are more common in women, and those with eating disorders are more likely to have suicidal ideation and attempts. Another issue that's particularly salient that puts someone at risk is a lifetime history of traumatic experiences. That might be experiencing abuse as a child. Um, that could also include both physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, but also during adulthood, whether that's a sexual assault or intimate partner violence, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. And then finally, military sexual trauma, those who've experienced that are more likely to die by suicide in our female population. So a few points here about the suicide risk and factors associated with intimate partner violence. This is, as I said earlier, increased likelihood of, of dying by suicide, of attempts of suicide and ideation. But I do want to point out women veterans have a higher a higher risk than civilian women for experiencing interpersonal partner violence. Um, and that's associated with factors such as greater health concerns, greater mental health concerns, hopelessness, social isolation, some of these drivers. So as we see women veterans who are struggling with intimate partner violence, really thinking practically of how can we reach out and help those individuals, so that's important. There's some unique factors for women that I wanted to highlight related to women's reproductive cycles. So premenstrual dysphoric disorder, individuals with this also have a greater likelihood of having suicidal ideation. I do want to point out, things have changed related to our research about women who are pregnant. That is not a protective factor against suicide. Sometimes people think that, and it's not. In fact, we know that discontinuing antidepressant medications is common when one's pregnant, of course. They're thinking about the baby, but that can also increase suicide risk. And among perinatal women who die of self-harm 
where we have that discontinued antidepressant medication. It's something we're working with our folks who prescribe medication to continue education about this. And up to 20% of those who die postpartum are deaths related to suicide. And you all know that we have increased risk of depression during that time. And then lastly, as women begin to enter menopause, it's another time of increased risk for experiencing thoughts of suicide. So uh, those are some of the risk factors. I just want you to think through individuals in your life or, or folks in your life that you know have any of these risk factors and how can we begin reaching out to them. But I also like to focus on what are the positives that we can look for to? What are the protective factors against suicide? Motherhood has been shown, particularly with young children, are more, less likely to have uh, attempted suicide, lower risk of suicide. And one of the things that we think about that is women with younger children are often more connected in the community with family members, with friends, and connectedness is critically important. I love what Dr. Davis said a little while ago, when people are 10 feet away from you making eye contact, four feet away or doing a greeting, how do we continue to engage connectedness? And I can't help but think about that with DAV because I think this is what you do so beautifully and hearing the women in the video at the beginning, it's about connection and you build a home for veterans and you build a home for women veterans and that's a beautiful way to have protection against suicide meaning in life. What makes a person continue on? What is that for them? And time that in daily our discussions with others. Another thing that's different for women is we found that women are more likely to ask for help, which is a good thing. We want people to feel comfortable reaching out and asking for help. They're more likely to use helplines. They're more likely to talk with their family physician. They're more likely to discuss problems with others. I don't know about you all, though. I think it's still hard. Is it not when we're struggling to ask for help? I know I have that in my mindset when I have, have to tell someone, hey, I really could use some help here, y'all, and this is a really rough time. That's tough for me to do, too. So when you have women veterans in your life, you're telling me, this is a tough time for me. Know how hard it is for them to, to express that. And really take that as a cue if this is the time I need to kick it up a notch with my outreach to them, with my friendship to them, with my, with my support to them. And interestingly, religious activity and spirituality have been found to have some protective factor for suicide in women. Um, those who have frequent attendance at faith-based activities indicate that um, there's a reduction in suicide risk. And for some populations, the spirituality can have these protective factors. So these are all things just to consider so here's my call. Suicide prevention is everybody's business. It's something we can all do. We can all help save lives. And in particular, there's five different items that I want to, to touch on for you. One is, you know, our work will continue in the Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention in this area. One thing your report also indicated was the importance of having standardized screening related to suicide risk. I can tell you with great happiness that this year we have rolled out the largest standardized suicide risk assessment process, a process in the country. It's the gold standard. And to date already we have 1.5 million veterans who've been screened and have been able to get help because of that new process. So we're very much in alignment with that. The other thing that our office has rolled out most recently in the last couple of years is safe day access to mental health care. So that when a veteran comes in, we can get them access. <laughs> Developing innovative prevention strategies, and that's where I'll talk a little bit about our public health model, reaching out to you all and asking your assistance for this, but also using analytic strategies where we can actually identify through our medical record system individuals who are higher at risk and we notify their providers and their providers proactively reach out to them. It's called ReachVet, and we're having some great outcomes related to that and use of the data that's there in our system. Going on the far right, reaching veterans and their families. Some of the things that we've been working with the community on is our first community-based program to increase safe firearm storage. We work with seven states and the National Shooting Sports Foundation and the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and that. We also have um, in front of my notebook over there, there's a gun.
Dunlock. There are free Dunlocks available up at the VA booth there. If you'd like to give that to anyone or have that on, on hand if you are storing your own weapons of any kind, it gives a little bit more time for individuals to think through when we actually store our, our arms in a safe manner. And that's something you all talked about in the report too. One of my good colleagues, Dr. Limley, I know that's very much in his heart as well. And so we appreciate the partnership around safe storage. We also launched the Governor's Challenge and the Mayoral Challenge related to suicide prevention that some of my colleagues mentioned in February of 2019. Seven states, 24 cities, all committed to have proactive suicide prevention. And then lastly, working um, across the United States in 100 largest markets, a billboard campaign along with PSA advertising started in Times Square, advertising the Be There initiative for, for veterans. Finally, changing the conversation. Y'all, talking about suicide is hard. And I don't want to dismiss that. As a trained professional, it is hard for me to talk about it at times. But it's more important that you let that person know you care. It's important to reach out. And as you do, you will feel that response from the others around you and giving you support to also reach out to others. So what we're doing in VA's public health approach is realizing not every veteran is enrolled in VA health care. There's a lot of veterans every year who die by suicide who've never been enrolled in VHA, and this is my call to each of you in the room. We need your help reaching women veterans that we don't touch. We need you to come alongside of us. Help us to partner with you better so that we can reach those who aren't enrolled in as well as give us feedback so we can improve our own care to the veterans, women veterans who are in the VHA. And then here's just a number of individuals and organizations that we're working to partner with right now. Important points along this line is don't be afraid to start the conversation. Don't be afraid to reach out to leaders and ask them to join in the efforts. There's no special training to show genuine concern. You all know this as veterans already. How do you reach out if you have someone else's back already? How do you continue to do that daily? Small actions of support matter. Sending someone a text, grabbing a coffee with someone, those things matter. And use the resources available to you. And I'll show you a few at the end of the slide deck that I think will be helpful. I do want to highlight here, I'm very grateful for the men and women who came before me on suicide prevention who really saw it's not just about reaching the, the few at the end. So what this classification says, we have to reach everyone for suicide prevention. All of us are at risk. Every single person is at risk. You can get to a low point super quick. You never know what life is going So we have to reach everyone. Then we have select individuals who are at higher risk that we need to do even more proactive things for. And then we have few. These are people who are at imminent risk of harming themselves. And there's different strategies for each group. So my call for you is to think through how can I help across these different settings. And in particular DAE, I hope that you will help with the universal strategies as well, but that you become even more knowledgeable about other things we can do to partner together for those at higher risk in the selected field. So some women veteran resources. So we have a few things here I wanted to highlight. The Veterans Crisis Line. Wonderful resource to have. In a moment, I'll put the number up, and I'm going to ask you to pull out your phones and put it in. You never know when you may need that number, so just go ahead and procure yourself now for that. Coaching into care. That's a wonderful resource for supporting others and family to talk with someone who knows about VA resources and how do you get people into care in the system. Because it's not always easy getting into the VA system. Sometimes that's very difficult, so coaching into care helps along those lines. We also offer a whole spectrum of mental health services from, did you all know that there are mental health providers in primary care? That's where I started. So when someone's first talking with their primary care doctor, they can walk across the hallway to a mental health professional who's desired, right there in the current same day access. All the way up to more specialty services, residential treatment, inpatient services, but a whole host of outpatient services as well. And that includes evidence-based psychotherapies. It includes peer support. I'm excited that we're continuing.
continuing to work to expand peer support. I think that's really critical and to expand the number of women that are serving in those roles. Um, specialty treatment for PTSD, we, we've talked a lot about that in the past for the AD. But getting folks into evidence-based care as well as providing additional services. I do want to highlight there's a national network of women's mental health champions. So at each of your sites in the VA, each healthcare system has a point of contact that can help you navigate the services that are available and special services and screening related to military sexual trauma. I do want to highlight particular Susan McCutcheon is our lead, Dr. McCutcheon. Um, for women's mental health services in particular, we focus on gender sensitive mental health training for clinicians um, in the mental health lane as well as in primary care and other settings. And we have a few things I wanted to highlight you may not know about the VA DOD women's mental health mini residency skills training. Um, this is a, a training program in particular for mental health providers who want to have even more specialized um, understanding and awareness of the needs of women veterans. So this was launched just a couple of years ago. The skills training for affective and interpersonal regulation, that's a mouthful. I prefer just to call it STARE. And STARE is eight to 10 sessions related to trauma treatment for women veterans only. And it also includes, for those who are parents, a parenting component. We also are, are very excited about this new eight-week outpatient program that's been started over the last couple of years. It's an interdisciplinary eating disorder treatment program. It's something I know your report highlights as well, those unique needs that are needed for that population. And I already spoke a little bit about these other things. And I'll highlight here just one of the things I want to let you know. I think sometimes people think of military sexual trauma as just for women. And I want to, I know I'm highlighting it here. That's not the case. Military sexual trauma happens to women and to men. The military sexual trauma coordinator at each site is available to help get individuals into service, and it is free of charge to us. And my colleagues here already talked a little bit about um, all VA programs for women veterans. These individuals at each site are so incredibly helpful a number of ways to help navigate some of the processes locally to get in care. And our Women's Veterans Call Center, if you didn't catch it before, take a picture real quick. I know Jackie I mentioned it, but I wanted to highlight it again. How many of you have been on the Make the Connection site? Okay, you really want to go here. It's maketheconnection.net. And one of the things I love about it I learn more from hearing personal stories and experience of navigating difficult times. I've always heard, you know, when I hear someone speaking in their own voice versus me in a suit up here telling you, hear another better. And what I love about this website is it's got hundreds and hundreds of interviews you can search by concern that they have or if they're a female veteran or not, a whole variety of things, and you can hear the voice of the veteran and how they address whatever challenge was in their way at the time and talk about the resources available to them. To me, that makes much more of a difference in hearing personal stories. So it's for veterans, but it's also for family and friends. When you think about what kind of resources can I share with other people, Make the Connection is a great site. We also have highlighted on here something that our program has um, dedicated in doing is translating the best research into practice. This is something we use for providers or as you're connected with community providers as well. But it summarizes the best new science in different areas. I highlight this because we have two recent issues related to women veteran topics that I think would be of interest to all of you. And this whole website here has a host of resources and um, things that you can use. The other is the Be There Prevention Initiative. Uh, this is where I told you get your phone number or phone out. Here's the number for the hotline. You never know when you, you may need to use that or also when you may be with someone who's struggling, a friend may use that. So I encourage everyone, I have it coded in my phone because I'm afraid I'm going to forget the number when I'm in a crisis situation at some sometime. So it's 1-800-273-8255. When you dial it, you'll press one, so you'll get to the veterans crisis line. I encourage you all to put it in. You never know when you might want to share that contact by text with a friend. And also have that. Yeah. Oh, repeat. 
1-800-273-8255. And as we move into Suicide Prevention Month next month, I encourage you to share that on your Facebook pages, share it on your Instagram, share it with other people so that they have that resource handy. The Be There Prevention Initiative also talks, BeThereForVeterans.com, talks about what the simple things are that we do every day as part of suicide prevention. And then I encourage you just to stay connected. There's all kinds of different resources for you. But my call is this. We need your help in reaching those who we never touch in being. You all have such a great relationship and connectedness with women veterans. Help us to reach out to them and continue to give us feedback so that we can do an even better job in reaching out to those already in our system. So, thank you. Well, thank our guests again for these three great presentations. Um, I know this last one is one that's near and dear to my heart as well. VA's done a great job. They've come out and done uh, trainings um, at the VA office in Washington because, again, you never know when you might be on the phone or talking to someone that may need the crisis line there for help. So please, please code those into your phones. Make sure that we're looking out for each other, um, all veterans, but for women veterans, you know, we really, you don't want to walk by somebody and you see they're down and may just need somebody to say, hey, are you okay? Um, it really, it, it's not that difficult. It's a simple thing you do um, when you see somebody that's really struggling. Um, and if you have problems, if there's an issue with, you know, getting the care you need or um, some, some things happen at one of the VA medical centers or clinics, speak up. You know, make sure that the clinic director knows about that, the hospital director, the women veterans coordinator. People are there to help us get the care that um, we need and we deserve. And so don't just sit back and say, well, you know, I'm just not going to go back because that didn't work out for me. We want the VA to be there for everyone who needs it, and it's the best place. Um, they've done the most research about women veterans specifically, um, know the most about that population have some really compassion and dedicated VA providers. So let's give a round of applause to all of our guests. And I know in a minute the music's going to start up again, but they've agreed to be here um, to answer, you know, if you have any comments or questions up front, they're going to stay a little bit since we, we know the music is coming in moment. But again, thank you to all of you so much for coming from Washington, D.C. to be with us. And uh, was a great presentation. Yes. The welcome kit. Okay, let me read it again. Everybody read the welcome kit that wants the information from over here. So, so welcome dash. 